Is that Rami? Rami. Taza. Nice to meet you, Rami. Welcome on the show. Thanks. Must be happy to be here. A pleasure, uh, you know, seeking you out to, on the show. Like, I, I first heard of you, I was surfing through some university stuff and I was like, mm-hmm. oh, like, I'm interested in this sort of subject and I went on uh, the university's papers and your one was on emotions and I was like, oh, this sounds interesting. Mm-hmm. And then I read a few, I went on your website and you came up, you were talking with this guy about emotion. I was like, damn, this is some interesting topic. So I reached out to you and, you know, yeah. gratefully you're on the show. The first question I sort of wanted to ask is like, what do you do? Like, what's, 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 what's this all about? It's my work. Yeah. Know, I've always thought it would be a really interesting thing to have a, a series called What Do Philosophers Do? Because yeah. it sounds like, what do we do? And I think it's this thing where um, often when you go to a party, someone will say, you say you're a philosopher. And then they say, tell us your philosophy. And I think like, <laughs> what do you mean, tell us your philosophy? And I think maybe there's this kind of pop culture image that philosophy is just like slogans. So maybe they think that I'm just spending my whole time in, in my office, just, just trying, to, <laughs> trying to think of like this one, one slogan to sum up my life. Yeah. So that's not <laughs> what, I, yeah. what I do. I think, I mean, I'm an academic, so I think a lot of what I do is like teaching, research, and in terms of my, my own work, um, so I'm a philosopher of mind. So I used to uh, work on consciousness and the relationship between the physical world and the mental. So, yeah. I mean, how do brain states relate to conscious experience? So my PhD was on what's called the hard problem of consciousness. And um, the hard problem is really explaining how um, the f- physical processing, especially in your brain, can give, ri- give rise to conscious experience so you know like you're seeing me now you're seeing certain colors Mm. you're hearing certain things if I give you a coffee you'll be tasting the kind of bitter qualities in in that coffee yeah how do these subjective experiences result from this physical thing i.e neural processes so that's that's kind of the the hard problem and of course I solved the hard problem after I finished my PhD and moved on to so what's no, the I, answer? I didn't. <laughs> so what's but the answer? I think, uh, well, that, what's the slogan? All right. No, there's different theories, but um, part, partly what I do now is I, I work on emotion, but um, a lot of what I do is kind of at the intersection of philosophy of mind and cognitive science. So I draw on a lot from cognitive science and a bit of psychology and a little bit of neuroscience because, because of the nature of, of what I do which is I work on emotions. It's, a, it's one of those things which a lot of people in a lot of different disciplines have, have worked on. Mm. So I think as a philosopher, it would be a bit weird for me to ignore all the psychological data on it, all the kind of neuroscience yeah. on it. And wha- a lot of what I'm really interested in, in is um, even if you have the sciences, there's theoretical aspects to it. So you can run an experiment and come up with results, but then there's like a bit of theory where you're drawing from the data to make certain conclusions. Mm. And during that point, there's a, a lot of theorizing to be to be had. So I'm kind of interested in yeah. the theoretical role. So is that, that you solved, you ask ethical questions relating to the science, or is it do you trying to understand the science through a you know theoretical lens? It's no good question. It's not my personal work is not ethical. Yeah. Um, well, it's it's ethical, <laughs> but it's not about. <laughs> I hope will, you know, not on work that it's ethical, but um, it's not about anything to do with morality per se. But what I'm interested in is um, there are certain kinds of assumptions that people have historically, yeah, and then the question is, awesome. um, do these assumptions do they stand up to scrutiny now, given the kinds of data we have? So. At the moment, I'm really interested in how emotions affect reasoning. So historically, people always thought of emotions as disruptive things, and people would say, you know, stop being so emotional, like think, think rationally. And one of the things that people have found is um, people with certain damage to certain parts of the brain to do with emotion, once that's been damaged, they make really poor choices. So, so it seems like emotions must play some positive role. I mean, especially if emotions evolved, Mm. suppose they're adaptations, I'm not saying they are, but if perhaps they are, then they must do some positive work. Then the question is how to articulate what the actual positive thing is. And there's a lot of scientific data, and especially in psychology and Mm. and neuroscience to suggest that it does something, 
but then my the, it's not still clear what that thing is. So I'm interested in what that exact thing is. Understanding it. Yeah, so yeah. So how far are we from really understanding how emotions play a role? I think we're on the right track. I mean, sometimes, you know, you make progress and then the psychological experiments turn out to be dubious or there'll be new data that undermines the earlier yeah. data. But one of the really in cool things I think that emotions do is it, it focuses your attention. So in a way, one of the things that people say is you're trying to make a, ch a choice. So you're trying to choose something. And there might be like a hundreds and hundreds of options about what to do. And then the idea is emotions will help you fixate on a few bunch of options. So it narrows down the search space. So it's almost like emotions act like a, a torchlight and it kind of shines on a set of things. And then it doesn't tell you what to do, but it says consider these options and avoid these other options. Hmm. Do you want, to, you want me to give you an example? Yes, to, give to, me an example. That was um, very complex. Sorry, no, no. <laughs> um, so uh, the idea might be something like you're figuring out what to do tonight and um, someone invites you to this, to this bar and you've had really bad emotional experiences when you've been to that bar before. Maybe the bartender's really rude to you or your, your ex always is there at the bar. Mm. So when you think about going to the, that particular bar, you feel bad. And mm. because of that, you're going to avoid going to that bar. So you've already ruled out one option because of an emotional response that you're having. And you can imagine the same kind of thing with the positive case where there's some options which you might be neutral about, but some which you might think I've had really good experiences in the past there. You've, may, you've been happy or kind of, you know, you felt joy or mm. you know, maybe you don't really... Doesn't that play a massive role in sort of like racism and bias in general? No, gr exactly. Because I'm really interested in, in um, and that's the new thing that I haven't really yeah. written about, but there's these biases and what's interesting is emotions might be relevant, but um, they can be learned, these biases. So how do you account for these responses which are really quick like that, but they you acquire them over time? And so the, the example, so I really started working on this or thinking about this when I lived in the US and this was around that time when all the shootings were happening of um, black American men, especially, yeah. or young young men too. Yeah. And um, I mean, it's been, it's been happening for a long time, but now there's documentation, right, with... Um, Actual, like, footages. That yeah, yeah. So, so what's happening? And a lot of things might be happening, but some of it might be that some of these cops are going into black neighborhoods and they're not familiar with that, and there's all these negative stereotypes of blacks in, in America. So you're already heightened, you're emotionally aroused, mm. and that makes you, like, react in a different way to how you would have reacted if you're going mm. in in a more emotionally stable way. So it seems like emotions, especially fear and anxiety, are probably playing some role. But the interesting thing is that racial bias towards black people, that's a learned thing. It's not, you're not born with like a bias towards. Yeah. And it plays the opposite way as well, like the bias of policemen mm -hmm. and policewomen in, you know, if they, especially if they're white, and they're in a black neighborhoods. That's like what that I was bias sure. is real strong as well. Sure, sure. And it's uh, interesting, you, we, you know, we're talking mm -hmm. about this because, you know, I've been closely like just thinking about it and observing that we make so many general, you know, general sort of things like saying this person because he looks this way. Is mm -hmm. this sure. But, you know, from a very scientific point of view, it's like when your data set is so small mm -hmm. and when you make a, you know, conclusive argument, as this is that, mm -hmm. it's, it's, you know, it's irrational, it's not, it doesn't make sense. Sure. But yet we do it on a consistent basis, mm -hmm. you know? And I want to understand why though. Is it because we want to shorten the decision-making process and categorize things? I think definitely. I think we, our brains are probably designed to use heuristics, right? Yeah. So these biases can be negative or positive, but you're using shortcuts. So what happens is, you, you, as you said, it's a small sample and then you're generalizing and that's how it works. But then you, when you generalize using a small sample, you're gonna always run into exceptions to the rule, and that's mm. when the biases aren't playing a positive role. You're going to be wrong when you're faced with yeah. a bigger sample well, size. Well, it's confirmation bias as well. Once yeah. you've made the yeah, decision yeah. this person sure. is, yeah. then you know you could uh, disregard all those other actions, but when it aligns mm -hmm. with your view of this person, yeah. you're like, you, you know, you're sure. like, this is what it is. Sure. Which is very interesting. It doesn't, it doesn't really make sense, and it's not really smart to do so, but yet we 
you know, always do it. Yeah, I mean, I don't know if it's natural, but I think there's definitely a tendency to do it. And it's not just with an individual, right? You might do it with a group of people of a different race, or you might do it across um, gender lines. So you might say, you know, women are like this, and then, you know, you have this bias and you only pick out confirmations mm. of that of that bias and ignore all the other contra- contradicting that is data. Yeah. Well, it's, it's troubling as well, yeah. but it's it's really interesting in in a way. And it's, it seems like it's it's that thing. I think our brains... I'm not saying you can't override it. I think mm. you can override it. But, yeah, I think we, it, the brain isn't designed to do more work than it has mm. to, so it's always looking for easier ways to But this to has do massive things. implications to the person that's, you know, giving you your job or looking through your CV to the person, mm-hmm. you know, who's going to serve you at a sure. McDonald's. It, you know, it has massive implications, and I think a lot of... No one's really talking about it at that depth mm-hmm. of how to consciously... Uh, think about the generalizations we're making on a daily consistent basis Mm -hmm. which is shocking and uh, you know the implications are very vast I would say yeah and I think people are kind of a little bit clued on to this now with the implicit bias cases and and I know that in like cafes and stuff does that have any well I heard Mm -hmm. some you know some a podcast talking about the illegitimacy of the implicit bias tests and the implicit bias training of to get it out of your system. Can that... I'm not really sure. I mean, I know that I was going to say like places like Starbucks, which they've had controversy and they yeah. run these um, workshops for the staff. Yeah. So, <laughs> and I don't know what the success rate is like. And I mean, in a way, it's implicit, right? So you can't you can't know that you have this bias and you can try and account for it. And I'm not, sh- I'm, I'm sure it's not full proof, but my what I find interesting about the implicit bias, because there's a lot of traction now with this, but I think implicit, implicit bias is a broad umbrella term that's probably capturing a lot of different kinds of phenomena. And so, and I think for me, I'm also interested in the role emotions might play in explaining some of the implicit bias cases. And I'm not saying every single instance of implicit bias emotions are involved in those mm. cases, but I bet some, some probably are. So then how do you understand implicit bias in this broad sense, but tie that into how emotions might be biasing you in mm. certain ways as well. But mm-hmm. um, yeah, I'd be really curious to see um, if there are trainings, like ways to actually overcome yeah, it. Yeah, I did hear them. I did I did hear, especially in America, they're, mm-hmm. they're running those workshops on mm-hmm. how to get people to be not racist when they've <laughs> right. you know, sure. failed the racist test, the implicit bias right, test. Right. And the way I think they tested if you were racist yeah. implicitly uh-huh. was... Yeah. They would flash, uh, you know, like objects. Sure. And they'd flash like a weapon, and yeah. then they'd flash like uh, different genders or different sure. races. Yeah. And they'd measure your heightened sense of uh, emotional response. Sure. And was it correlating with the mm-hmm. weapon and the race? And if it matched, then conclusively it meant you were implicitly biased mm-hmm. negatively. Yeah. And then if it was a white person and a positive thing, then sure. you were, you know, stuff stuff like that. Which is, I don't know, like, it's a complex thing, which is hard to say but what's, if that works. I mean, what's interesting to me, again, I think with these cases, though, is these these things are automatic now, right? And that's what that's what they're measuring with these experiments, because mm. there's almost like no actual high-level conscious activity going on. It's too soon. But these are still things which are acquired. Mm. So how do, you, how do these learned things over time get to become automatic? And that's the interesting question, I think. So I think people used to have this false dichotomy where if it's quick, then it must be innate. And if it's slow, then it's something that can be learned. But I think th- what these experiments show is that these kinds of biases can be very quick and they kind of can be implicit, but they can also rest on certain kinds of cultural mm. ideas. So like if you live in a culture where you think, you know, black people are lazy or black people are um, dangerous, um, then you're more likely to have these kinds of biases and they kind of feed into your brain and at some point it becomes automatic. But it's a bit like, it's not the same thing, but you know, like if you play sport or music, something is to start with, it takes a while to learn it, but once you learn it, it becomes automatic. But it's mm. once it's automatic, it's really quick, but it doesn't mean you were born with that, that okay, ability. Yeah. It's something that you train. Mm. So I think these kinds of things, it's a product of like a, kind of a diseased society yeah. in, in a way that kind of and what's interesting is these biases don't generalize across cultures and 
so the experiments I know, the biases, they even people within the black community still have the implicit bias against other black people because it comes from the culture yes, as, a, yes. as a whole. So, yeah. so I know that they've done, I don't know if you've heard about the shooter trials. No. no. So it's, a sim it's, a, it's not an actual shooting, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah. It's simulated and you're told to shoot at someone holding a weapon, but don't shoot someone who's not holding a weapon. And you get dif people of different kinds of skin colors and back ethnic backgrounds who are the people that you see. And most people are more likely to shoot at a black person who's not holding a weapon than a than mm -hmm. someone who is white or um, Asian. Yeah. Um, and what they found was, in terms of the test subjects, even both Asians and blacks and wh and whites, all of them would sh more are more likely to shoot at black people than than white people. So it's not that simply by virtue of you being black yeah. yourself, you're kind of immune from these in mm. these biases. So it's kind of really complicated. Wow. You know, is it are we still considered racist if it's implicit compared to being consciously racist? Do you see what I mean? Is sure. it you know when do we define when is the the line cross and defining someone as racist and when is it you know they just yeah. implicitly biased towards No, that's an interesting question. I mean, I think they're both troubling, but oh, may okay, maybe yeah. maybe the kind of the culpability goes away a little bit with the implicit case. So, I mean, if you're an overt, overt racist, then you kind of know that what you're doing is kind of in a way bad or you kind of hold a stereotypical view that you're consciously aware that you do. So I think you're much more culpable than maybe having it ingrained in you somewhere that you're not mm. aware of. Because I think what's interesting about those implicit bias cases are even like super liberal, open-minded people kind of yeah. have these biases. So maybe you're not as culpable, but you should still be trying to uh, like override mm. them or correct for them somehow. That's quite, that's very really hard to, you know, consciously control something that's sure. implicit. Sure. Um, it's so frustrating. Like, I don't, you know, like consciously you don't consider yourself as that, but yeah, you know, when you unconsciously start thinking like that, it's like, am I really that? And you start to question like, oh. yeah, you don't, you know, you don't, maybe it's really hard to, pick yourself up on it and what yeah. what you could do is maybe create various kinds of behaviors so like for me like so I, I grade students all the time and I don't know what kind of implicit biases I have and mm. maybe I'm more likely to grade certain kinds of names better than other kinds of names and a way to correct for it is just to not look at the names yeah so so that's a very what about style of writing handwriting could I there mean, be another so luckily if my students yeah. submit it like um, they submit electronic oh, okay, copies because right, 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 right. the really worst thing as an yeah. as an academic is like sometimes you have no idea what they're writing because the handwriting is so poor and my handwriting is so yeah, poor, yeah, poor yeah. too, but so you spend a lot of time trying to decipher yeah, yeah. like this foreign script mm. I think, um, yeah. But I think it's yeah. I think instead of saying let the names be there and then try and correct for it, I think there's other way simpler ways to just kind of. Mm. You know, um. see, then that points the question is like, if we wanted an unbiased system, mm -hmm. unbiased, could we in the future use computers to grade, computers to assess CVs, computers to assess, you know, job sure, sure. applicants, you know, promotion applicants, you know, all this no, stuff. But could the, we use that? No, though? but the problem, the really interesting problem now with kind of AI systems is mm. you can make these smart um, s computer systems which learn. So, so you don't build them by designing every single rule in yeah. it. These systems learn to perform well, and what they find is they acquire the biases that humans have. Really? As, yeah, totally. How so, though? so, so now I know that in some places. So, like I know that in the U.S. there was a case where they made a program that was very good at giving people home loans. Okay. And at some point they realized that it was kind of biased against certain ethnic groups. Oh, the system I did, itself. I, I heard this. Yeah, and yeah, so, yeah. so, and the problem is. It might, it might be behaving in a biased way, but maybe the algorithms aren't biased. But if you're designing a kind of system where you're not building in every single rule and you're letting the system learn itself, you don't know if it's biased or not. So mm -hmm. I think they've made those programs illegal. And right. So I have well, a colleague who works on this. Like, maybe. maybe if they fix that aspect of it, could it then be unbiased? No, I think the problem is these, um, these kinds of systems, the new systems that they're using, um, like machine learning and things like yeah. that. You don't know where to go in and fix. It's more like a black box. 
because you're not coding the whole thing. Right, right. So you train the thing, and um, because of that, you can't you can't isolate. Yeah. So you don't know you don't know if there's a problem to start with, mm -hmm. and even if you did, you don't know where to go in and change the thing without yeah. changing the whole thing. So so I think it's a little bit more complex than right. a bug, but, but ultimately it's it's a machine or like a software that has a similar problem problem to humans that it's this that kind of very yeah. odd. that's fascinating. It, no, I think it's yeah. really fascinating but also <laughs> kind of worrying yeah. at the same same time. So I think a kind of delegating the duties to to AI isn't going to solve this problem because the smart smart AI are kind of things which can learn yeah. as well and once once you're open for that you op you open the possibility that they acquire similar kinds of biases too mm. how, how far are we in fully understanding human consciousness and applying that to these artificial intelligence systems mm -hmm. in a way you know they can op you know theoretically operate as human beings mm -hmm. how far are we from well that? that's a good question i think the one of the problems is it depends what you mean by consciousness. So some people talk about awareness. Mm. So that might be just detecting something. And th that could be a very simple thing. Like I remember um, when I was a grad student, my supervisor was this young young guy and he was quite lazy, so he didn't want to clean up. So he, he bought this um, little vacuum cleaning robot. Yeah. And at that point, you know, back in the day, it was quite futuristic. So the robot would kind of go around his apartment yeah. and you can see how it works, right? So it's programmed to not bump into things and if there's something in front of it it, it tries to go sideways or something like yeah. that so in a way the robot is detecting things so in a way you could say it's aware of its environment but then the interesting that thing that philosophers care about is phenomenal consciousness which is um which is what i did my phd on which is the kind of subjective experience so to have sensations to feel certain things to to taste certain things what it is like mm. for you to have those experiences yeah. And that I think we're not really to have your own opinions about certain things. Not even opinions as much as um, just like a, p a pain, like right, right. like so. It's it's more just the physical sensation of of I don't know having a glass of wine or yeah. being hit on the head. Those kinds of experiences can we have build that into a conscious? And we don't Could rob. We? And so the question really, I think we are very far from like practically doing it. And I, I probably think that we probably die as a species before we get there, but I'm a pessimist. But yeah. I think the interesting question as a philosopher is not whether we could, how far we are from it, but whether it's in principle possible to do it. Do you mean should we or no, is it theor what, what theor is it? Yeah. theoretically? So so the, the real issue is about what kinds of things go into creating consciousness, right? So, so is it to do with certain kinds of operating systems? So maybe there's an operating system in the brain, and once you replicate that artificially, you create the same conscious thing. Or is it something else? So if it's something mysterious, like a non-physical thing that goes on to create consciousness, simply replicating the brain is not going to give you... So what do you mean by like the soul or I mean I I mean certain, I don't a certain like being or like a different I mean that's what I mean physical yeah not realm. not a soul per se yeah. but some people argue that um, the subjective part of experience it's metaphysically different from the physical nature of reality and I mean I I don't believe that I was I'm trying to defend a more physicalist yeah. picture so I think that we don't ex exactly know ex the details about how consciousness arises but i think it's probably like a lot of neural states and how your bo organ body is reacting with the environment so you can tell a whole kind of physical story and if you can replicate that in ai then in theory you sh there's no problem of creating the same kind of experience but if you think there's something else like an extra ingredient then simply replicating the processing is not going to give you the the actual product. The ex yeah, the extra yeah, thing. Yeah. So the debate is really about do we need an extra ingredient to explain consciousness? That's wow, that's, that's where that. Well, what is like? Do they know what they're looking for? That's a well, like so, so hard <laughs> to find what you're not yeah. aiming at. Or? Yeah, yeah, no, that's a really interesting question because in a way we all know what it is, which is the experience we have. You know, like. What's more but fundamental so, than like it's so than, than that? Big though, it's so mm -hmm. broad. It's so sure. It's it's hard to really put your finger down to what you know. This is all you know. This all is like mm -hmm. us being here, breathing, 
Thank sure, you. sure. You know, communicate. That's that's very hard. That is broad, but I think the question was about consciousness, mm. right? So phenomenal consciousness is just a subjective nature of your experience, and then the question is, can you replicate that? And c can we yeah. create create like a robot in yeah. theory that can have those kinds of experiences? And that I'm not sure about. And it really depends on like what the human brain is doing to create conscious experience. And it's, is there, so the argument really is about, so the, here's how it goes. Um, the brain performs certain functions to create experiences. So in theory, could you, if you created something artificial that wasn't a brain, that did perform the same function, could you have the same experience? And some people think the function is what's important, not the substance. Whereas other people think, no, the, it's not just the function. The brain is made up of chem certain kinds of chemicals and you know, neural processes rest on these kinds of chemicals. And maybe mm. you need those chemicals. It's not enough to just create the function. So people who think that think that you can't create an artificial intelligence mm. being or a robot or whatever that has human experiences. And people on the other side call people who think that like meat chauvinists because they think there's something important about you know being made of yeah, meat that yeah. creates that so that that's like a big ongoing yeah. debate between the two two things i think also memory comes in part as well sure and we are like i think one philosopher said or one so sure. why is it <laughs> we are our memories mm -hmm. like our you know lives are made up of memories sure, yeah. of our past and how does that play the role in consciousness and mm -hmm. you know developing such a system yeah i mean i think there's a there's two ways that that in a way i mean that's a really poetic way of describing it and in a sense you are the product of all your experiences and there's a very loose way in which which mm. it's kind of a beautiful way in which that's that's true but i think what we are finding now is there's a more literal way in which that's true as well so right. a lot of people so when i was working on consciousness i think it wasn't that trendy to really think about memory and how that affects consciousness. And now some people think that consciousness is partly created because of memory. And yeah, so there's always a lag in, in a way. And maybe you need what's called like working memory. So there's like the past and what you think about, you know, yeah. like you think about growing up and you think about holidays and things like that. But there's a sense in which your current, like you're, you're hearing me talking and you're seeing me, that's yeah. still created partly as a product of yeah of memory which is a very different kind of idea yeah so that's i think much more new so i'm really interested in like that how that would be developed yeah, yeah, yeah. over and there's also people who think that um consciousness is just hallucination as as well which is mm -hmm. like really like a neat kind that's of idea yeah that's very hard to put your head around though it's very well mm -hmm, yeah it's it's hard to sort of that's like same way in a stimu simulated environment, universe and world. Or, or so yeah. along those lines of. Sure, I mean it's not quite like the kind of. Yeah. I don't even know if people know the Matrix <laughs> any, anymore, but it's not quite that. But there are, there's something right about what you said, which is the part about simulation. And some people think that waking life, i.e., the conscious experience you have, is your brain simulating something so so i mean the historical view was what you're seeing is just what's out there and you have yeah. direct access unfiltered yeah. to stuff like you are seeing me directly the other view is that your brain is kind of creating things based on me being here and what, what your brain is running is really a simulation of that of that no you don't have direct access to to me so uh, it's kind of a <laughs> i mean it's a it's a view that annoys tradi yeah. traditionally minded yeah. philosophers yeah. because it it takes away the neat idea that you have like knowledge of reality because yeah. you think you know no we see things i see you know my jacket over there or the the books over there or things yeah. things like that and on this other view it's those things are still yeah. there but what's really happening is those things are interacting with your body but ultimately what's happening in your head is a simulation of your environment it's not Mm. directly the environment as it is and it's an interesting yeah. view another very fascinating phenomena is imagination mm -hmm. that and that sure. how that plays a role in you know how we can just close our eyes and think about things happening mm -hmm. things being created out of you know nothing really mm -hmm. sure that 
and how that plays a role in consciousness yeah and how that makes us feel mm-hmm. and how you know some people say like you know to become successful or try you know if you're going for a goal you know sure. start imagining it start sure. making it very real yeah and then i've used it and it's been very very powerful it's like, it's like it worked for you well to a degree <laughs> though right. you know what yeah. I mean? like you, when you think about it it's like you're solidifying it in a way mm-hmm. yeah and that i've always found that fascinating how that works and you know h- how that all happens and fits into place it's yeah so what i'm I mean, to be honest, I'm not sure if philosophers or anyone really knows what imagination is yet. It's a massive part of our lives as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's a huge part of, you know, depends on how social you are. <laughs> but, you know, you might spend a lot of time in your room imagining things. <laughs> yeah. um, but what's really interesting um, f- for me is the effect, not in terms of career goals or anything like but that, but the physical brute effect imagination might have on how you perceive things. So, so there's been some data to suggest that your imagination can play a role in how you taste things or how you hear things. And that might that might change the way something tastes to you or the way something sounds to you, depending on your ability to imagine certain other kinds of things. So that's kind of a really interesting thing where like your actual the actual thing you see or hear or taste might be affected by what you're able to imagine. So it seems like there's this mental part about imagination, but that's kind of influencing your perceptual mm. right, right. processing system as well. So th- arguably these things, yeah. we, used to, we used to think these things are completely separate, but maybe they're linked in interesting yeah. ways or there's kind of interesting pathways between. So is it sort of like, uh, you know, the ability to taste really good food is mm-hmm. only predicted or dependent upon how much of a good food can you imagine tasting or sure how good is it it's, it's a little bit because because it ties in with a broader debate um it's called um it's got it's called cognitive penetration and it's not a nice <laughs> nice term and i i heard oh, that the person uh, who coined that term didn't believe in it so they wanted to give it a really ugly yeah, yeah. ugly name <laughs> but the idea is um we used to think of cognition and perception as separate so perception count like so tasting something, seeing something, hearing something, these are all perceptual processes. Then cognition is more about be having beliefs or imagining things or thinking. So there's the cognitive part of your brain and the, the perceptual part of yeah. the brain. And m- everyone grants that perception influences cognition. So what you see will change what you believe, for example. So you look, you look out and you see that it's raining, so now you think it's raining. So there's what's called um, bottom-up processing in, in psychology. What's more interesting and controversial is whether there's top-down processing, so does cognition affect perception? And here's an example. So say you, um, you, you have no idea about wine and you taste wine and we're drinking and at, and then you went and did proper training and you become a sommelier yeah, and right, right, and right. then you come back you know i don't know how long it will take you yeah, <laughs> but yeah, you come yeah. back in three years time and we're drinking the same same wine the question is you as an expert now you've acquired a lot of b- new beliefs and skills does that make it so does your experience of tasting the wine change or is it just that you're much more articulate in talking about it so people who bind the cognitive penetration mm. think that it actually literally changes the way the wine tastes taste to you. And the same thing with other mo- perceptual modalities. So if, you are, uh, if you know a lot about music, does it make the sounds, do you hear the sounds different to someone like me who's not, not trained, for example? That is a very yeah. so it's a, interesting question. So this is yeah. what cognitive <laughs> penetration yeah. is. Because it's, uh, it's well, penetrating your perception. some sort of logic to it as well. It's like mm-hmm. they say, you know, an amateur compared to a master sees mm-hmm. same things so differently. Yeah. Which, you know, it does hold a lot of truth to it because one person has so much experience can, you know, imagine different things with that. Yeah. Whereas the other person has a limited data set, really. Sure. But the, the controversial thing, though, is, I mean, you can't empirically, scientifically test because mm-hmm. you can't go into someone's head and say it's if looks well, could diff- you test it? No, I mean, what you can do is run different kinds of things where you can say this person has more skills. So like if you do blind tests on wine, you might be better able to pick out the kind of wine and the year it was being produced and those kinds of things. And I might not be able to, but yeah. that just shows that you have, you're more skillful about it. Not that how it tastes you ultimately 
changed. I, I think it's a good, I th personally, right. I think it's an indication that it has changed, that yeah. your experience, but you can't study experience directly. I mean, you can't go into someone's head. All mm -hmm. I can do is kind of either ask you about your experiences or try and test it indirectly by these kinds of tests, well, I think. You got a question, what do we mean by change though? Mm -hmm. The change of experience, does it mean change of experience in what, so you know, is it the taste or is it the overall experience? Because um, the overall experience sure. would definitely change. Of course, yeah, no, it's the taste but itself. But are we saying taste itself? Yeah, that's the controversial. Right. I know, I grant that, yeah. the overall thing would change. Well, that's hard to sort of, uh, you know, compartmentalize and test it. That no, exactly, thing. you can't. It's so interlinked. No, to totally, it. and that yeah. you can't, and that's that's why it's an ongoing ongoing issue. It's it's not clear. And it ties in, in with like all kinds of biases too. So your people have done v various tests with, with objects and it seems like um, if you have certain stereotypes, like a banana is something that's yellow, then you're more likely to see it as being yellow even if it's, if it's not, because your brain mm. is already predicting that it's gonna be yellow. So there's a sense in which they think that um, you're more likely to see it in the yeah. stereotypical color. And they've done really interesting things with, um, goes back to the racial thing, um, yeah. with faces and they get like a, what the, it's a computer, it's a face that's designed by like a computer program and you get like a stereotypically black face, yeah. a stereotypically white face and, an, and a neutral face, which is like a mixture of, of the two. Yeah. And they all are the same shade of gray and people are asked to judge which face is darker and which one's lighter. And people are more likely to judge the one that looks stereotypically like with African-American features as being darker than mm. the one that's got more kind of, you know. Yeah, so we assert our own imagination towards how it should look like. Yeah, I think because you see certain features and you think, okay, yeah. this person must be like that. Like color. a yeah, 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 so so again, the question is in that case, is that are you just stereotyping or do you actually see the the black, the stereotypically black faces yeah. being grayer. Well, then we've got to ask the question is, you know, when is stereotyping and generalizing mm -hmm. moral and when is it immoral? You know, which circumstances yeah. can we say, like, you know, an example I was taught was, you know, when you touch hot a hot stove, mm -hmm, sure. you won't touch it again because that experience has made that, ex you know, sure. act mm -hmm. a harmful experience. So yeah. you're generalizing that sure. thing. So you don't do it again, whereas that's could, you know that's immoral to say, do that with an experience with a different sort of uh, race mm -hmm. that made you feel that sure. harmful way. You see what I mean? Yeah, I mean I think it's a little bit different because I think yeah. you wouldn't touch a stove, arguably anyway, if you knew it was <laughs> like. Well, and you, let's say if you were sure. young. Let's say yeah, if yeah, you, you yeah. didn't know that yet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's just kind of like one band or something. Yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I, I mean, I don't really think about morality that much yeah. being a philosopher of mind but i guess any kind of bias is is immoral when it's harmful to someone i mean you you to what extent like to whose opinion of what's harmful and what's not i, I guess it, for me it would be more like like it, any kind of um ism right like sexism or racism or those kinds of things are based on biases and they're bad because it affects a group of people but you might have other kinds of shortcuts you might think people who young people who wear hoodies are probably students that's a that's a shortcut you know <laughs> that's not necessarily a harmful yeah, thing yeah. so it's still a bias yeah. like it you're still using a shortcut yeah to i'm saying generally. when it, when should sure. that be allowed and when the other should Beca not be because allowed. i when think is it? one is harming one is a group harming of people and the other one seems more in, like, right. like pretty mundane like yeah, it, yeah. so i i think it's fine to generalize as long as you're not mm. so the bad thing is like if you go to a it might not be predictive so if you, if you're if you are interviewing someone for a job and they happen to be a woman it would be bad to say well they're a woman so they won't be capable of performing this like a like a man would do yeah. or something like that that would be a harmful yeah. thing and the, it's problematic, not just because it's harmful to that woman, but it's not true, <laughs> right? Like we know that yeah, yeah. these yeah, things are- data set of- Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. like, w I mean, men and women perform roughly equally on these kinds of yeah. tasks, or women are on the whole, maybe better at some of these mm. kinds of things. So it would be weird to make that claim, it's just false. Whereas if, if, if you have a job interview and you, everyone's coming in dressed nicely and someone comes in wearing 
you know, a hoodie or something, you might think you you're still generalizing. You yeah. probably think this person doesn't they're wearing a hoodie so they don't they're not taking it seriously or something like that. And maybe that's still harmful to the, to, the pers- yeah. to the person, but it's not harmful to as a group, like you know, it's not harmful to everyone who wears a hoodie or something like wow. uh, you know, and it's not it's not based on also maybe it's also like those differences are based on things you can control and things which you can't. Yeah. yeah, I mean I'm not the right person to ask about these things. But for me, the difference would be some biases are okay and some biases aren't, and the ones that aren't are things which mm. harm. It's like a, you know, some actions yeah. harm people, some actions don't, and the bad ones are the ones that harm, mm. ha- harm What are people. some of the massive questions that philosophers, mm. academic philosophers, are trying to answer in this day and age? In this day and age. I think what's interesting about philosophy as a discipline is it's not that the old questions get answered and you move move on. Oh, so in a way, yeah, progress yeah. is slow. But for me, what's interesting is the questions change, which kind of speaks to what you were saying. So there might be related questions. So for me, um, as a philosopher of mind, the, the historical question was the mind-body problem. How does the mind and body relate to each other? Can yeah. they interact? And that's been changed a little bit. And now the question is more how does physical process in the brain result in conscious experience. So in a way, it's it's a similar problem, but it's also a different problem. So in a way, this is the contemporary version of the mind body problem. Yeah. And so that you can ask, you can have questions like that. But the, I think the, the fundamental, more big picture questions like does God exist? Like, why are we here? What's the meaning of life? Those kinds of questions. I think people have good answers to it, but it doesn't mean that those questions have now been solved because people still disagree about the various answers mm. like I mean theists and is that like very hard especially in you know especially in a subject like this mm-hmm, where sure. it's not like science where mm-hmm. there's truth and there's you know not truth yeah you can test it through tests yeah you, know, you can actually have a conclusion through a lot of experiments mm-hmm. of this is that you know whereas you know especially philosophy is a lot of your experience and how mm-hmm. how you explain that sure phenomena and it's sort of like who you side with in a way. It's like a spectrum rather than a definitive yes or no. Yeah, I mean, I, I do think that personally, I still think we aim for truth. Yeah. But, but it's it's not that easy to convince someone <laughs> that you're right because you can't yeah. run it and do an experiment because I think it's partly it's philosophical because it's not a science yeah. because it's you're not making or you're not investigating claims which can be shown to be empirically to be to be true or false but i think what you can do is you can draw on a lot of arguments and you can say well there's a lot of really good arguments for this one position and there's a lot of bad arguments for this other so it's better to pick right the one so you're not gonna side with the false or yeah so i think you can kind of i think the thing with to me with philosophy is is not that you have you you get all the answers but maybe you for me personally what i've realized is i came into philosophy with certain kinds of questions and I don't work on those questions anymore and it's not that I have definite answers to those questions but the kinds of answers that I think are plausible have been narrowed so so that's one thing so I can I now know that for one kind of question these are the three answers that I think are most likely whereas when I didn't do philosophy there was like a million different possibilities yeah. but also what's really interesting for me is you kind of know how the answers might go mm. so you have like a better map of how to okay. answer it and that to me is it's not as satisfying as an answer but it's it kind of it's informative and it kind of in a way you're still demystifying the mystery a little bit so yeah, yeah. so um you, you you might ask like before i did philosophy you might i might think like what is consciousness it's such a mysterious thing and now i might say well here are the three really good theories about consciousness that i can think of right now and i I'm I'm gonna I'm willing to bet on one of those theories being true. Yeah. So I'm already kind of ignoring a whole data set, yeah. really. So it kind of so I have a clearer understanding of what the so you can focus the energy on sure just on on, on that. So I think yeah. So I think it's not a it doesn't ch- it's not a th- system where you can churn out an answer per se. Yeah. But I think it gives you a better grasp on what the answers would look like. But I think the one really interesting thing for me, which I've rea- I realize more and more, is it helps you understand the question 
a bit better and sometimes some questions may sound deep but they might not be because they might be confused <laughs> and yeah. and and um and other questions might actually sound mundane but might be really deep and mm. i think you get a better sense of which questions are worth asking and which ones aren't mm. so is the the goal of the philosopher to mm. ask questions that need answering or need thinking about questioning our own uh, assumptions about that topic or how does this mm -hmm. all work in this sort of you know, realm? Yeah, I mean, because I think most people are naturally curious, right? And I think like, especially when you're younger, and the kinds of stuff that kids ask, these are <laughs> deeply philosophical <laughs> questions. And at some point you lose that because maybe life wears Should you. Should get a student loan? <laughs> yeah, well, not, not quite that. That is the ultimate philosophical <laughs> question. Um, <laughs> So, so I think there's a tendency where I think maybe philosophers are just children who stick with th that curiosity and they still want to press yeah. and ask these questions. But for me personally, I think what changes is uh, you ask different kinds of questions because you've already kind of explored certain theories and then it makes you ask more detailed, specific yeah. questions as well mm. that might relate to, so if you're interested in like, so I mean, I don't work on this, but one yeah. of the big questions is does God exist? So you know, yeah. you know that, that very Couple minor of thousand years of yeah co asking that question, and here's yeah. the answer. Yeah. You know? Okay, <laughs> um, but no, but but the thing is, how do you go about answering that question? Well, you might start off by saying, well, what what are the traits you might think God might have? Yeah. So in Islam, Judaism, and Christianity, there's this kind of idea that God is all powerful, all loving, all knowing. Yeah. yeah, all those. Kind of, it's the omni, omni yeah. God. Yeah. And then you might think, well, actually, what are the kind of chances of something like that existing? And some people think that maybe the all powerfulness is in conflict with the with an all loving being. Mm. So if that's the case, you might say, well you might reject that idea of God. Now, then the question is, can a being exist that's God-like, that doesn't have all those three traits? So you're asking different questions, but ultimately you're still interested in the I main question, yeah, does, yeah. God, does God exist? But by thinking about it, you're asking more specific kinds of questions. So in a way, like human understanding of God, I think is very anthropomorphic. You think it's basically like a dude with a beard who has all these kinds of prejudices right yeah. and is willing to act out on it yeah. if but isn't you do something that not bad how we're shaped because of the movies and the books and but even how we're we, sort of taught to think about but we thought theme. thought that like i mean uh, yeah. the pop culture sure but yeah. like even before movies and books people probably had these ideas because how do you understand something without thinking about how our environment other people you see as powerful <laughs> but the, the point is you can ask these kinds of questions but then you have to ask these other questions which is if there is a God, can you actually even grasp what that being yeah, would be that's like? What I was gonna ask, like? You know, like how is that? Yeah, and like, that's a different question, right? Yeah. And then the question is, for example, if if God turns out to be very different to what we originally think of it or him or her or they as being, does it make sense for them to be like homophobic or kind of would they care about those yeah, yeah, things yeah, within yeah. the kind of infinity of the universe? Mm. It seems to me personally, it seems if a creature like that exists who was capable of creating the universe i don't think they would give a hoot about you know like yeah, yeah, you know yeah. those kinds of small things but that completely so it seems like to me if there is a god the plausible kind of god is probably very different to what standard religion teaches yeah. you about god mm. as well so it's really interesting it, it is it is but i think from my experience with philosophy and you know learning mm -hmm. it in school I just go back to like what Socrates says, you know, mm -hmm. the sure. unexamined life is not worth living, which is such a, you know, when I think about that, yeah. it applies to every, everyone I would say. Really? Okay. I would say, the mm -hmm. reason why I say mm -hmm. that is because, you know, if we're not consciously thinking about why are we doing what we're doing, yeah, and what are the effects it's having on not just us, but other people, mm -hmm. are we really fully living this life? Or are we really, you know, doing the best we can with what we have. Yeah. And for me, sure. I, I just guess that's, you know, maybe I'm just biased because that's important for me to yeah. understand. But it's such an interesting uh, question and such a thing that I think still applies 
today. Yeah, I mean, I, mean, I yeah. think I'm a bit more charitable than Socrates. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> so to me, I mean, there's such a thing as the life of the mind and some people are a bit more inquisitive about these things than other people yeah. aren't. And personally, I mean, I am because I'm, I've chosen to make this my life yeah. in, in a way, at least my working life. But I mean, I look at people who don't ha seem to care about any of these things and mm. they seem to be happy and they're not harming anyone. I think their life is as worth living yeah. as, as as mine. Yeah. So I mean, I just happen oh, yeah. to be. Oh yeah, that's know, a very <laughs> extreme <laughs> statement. Like it's not worth living. <laughs> but I guess but what he meant was like start thinking about the, yeah. the important questions. Obviously, like yeah. No, no, yeah. Said, yeah. Uh, I know, no, you didn't mean it yeah. that way. But I maybe you get more out of life if you pursue these questions too in the same way that I think you get more out of life if you are into literature and music and books and sport like it's widen your interests right mm. um, so I think I'm a pluralist I think you should kind of be widening your horizons with everything maybe including these kinds of deep kinds of questions yeah but um, I certainly don't think that's the only way to right and so the world doesn't need that many philosophers, right? As, true, a, true. As, a, yeah. as a thing. I think if we all died... Too much supply I think decreases demand there. Yeah. No, I, I just think, you know, I don't remember... I remember live, when I was lecturing in, in the US, yeah. it was a small town called Bethlehem in Pennsylvania. And yeah. you'd have these big snow days and it would be minus 20 and it would be freezing and all the offices would be shut. You know, everything would be closed, but the university was open. And you'd be kind of risking your life to go in, and you just and all the students would be on crutches because they'd just kind of fell down at some <laughs> point. And I just think, is my job that important that I have to show up today? And I think no, <laughs> like right. you know. So I so I don't have that view that philosophy is the be all mm. and end all of yeah. of everything. I I, I mean, I, it's something that I personally find interesting, um, yeah. interesting and yeah. of of value. Um, but I think to me, I did became a philosopher because I had these questions that I wanted to yeah. answer and maybe when I had more of a sense of what those answers would be like I there were new questions to engage yeah. with so I've Isn't never been frustrating when you try to answer a big question your you know next thing you know 10 questions arise from answering that big question because you've got to you know, it's fun though. Like it's yeah. a bit like composing or something like <laughs> where, where you're, you're making a track and you, you want to make the whole whole song, yeah. but then you start obsessing over the hi-hat sound and mm. you know, it might take you three hours to get that <laughs> right. But it's f if you care about it, it's yeah, kind yeah. of fun and you yeah. want to get it right. And maybe the problem with philosophy is you, n you never end up writing or com finishing the song, but mm. maybe when it's done, it's game over. You know, <laughs> there's yeah. no point anymore so to me to me it's it's never it's interesting i maybe other philosophers might disagree but to me it's never been a point of frustration and i've always kind of wondered i am really curious about other careers and like i find other people's jobs immensely fascinating because the only real job i've had as an adult is yep. being a professional philosopher <laughs> which is not it's kind of a weird thing yeah. but but um to me i've never wanted to walk away from it because i've always just been hooked like yeah. and every time I write something, so you know, you spend three years working on something in philosophy of mind, and when it's done, there's it turns out there's a whole heap of other questions that you're kind of curious mm. about. So, it, at least I've so far been always right. hooked yeah. in, in a way, and it I've never found it to be yeah. frustrating. It's just more like a so. How do academics decide what to focus their energies on, or is it everyone just does what they? you know, are curious about? Or is it a structured process of, you know, everyone working on a specific question sort of to fit the whole landscape? I think probably a little bit of both. I think yeah. maybe, especially in the sciences, mm. there's much more collaboration I in that way. And you need different people to work on different different bits. Whereas I think in philosophy, my guess is you, you just do what you're interested in. And you might meet people who are working on something similar, but they've already independent of you decided to to work on that so yeah. if, if I mean I don't really normally write papers with other people but I, I there's, it's collaborative in the sense that I go to conferences on emotion for example and they might criticize my work and I'll criticize their work mm. and you're still making progress in by criticizing other people's work but you're yeah. engaging it as a collaborative element but I think the people are there because they all independently found the topic right. interesting but but maybe like if, if you're younger, there's like an empo employability factor and you might try and work on something that's a bit sexy at that point yeah, just yeah, so yeah. that it looks it looks better. But I think it's a little bit, if you're going to do it for your life, it's, no, you have to be interested. And I think that's what really guides it. It's, but the nice yeah. thing I find is it's that freedom where if I get really sick of what I do in terms of research, 
just change it. <laughs> you know, like that is amazing yeah, to yeah, me yeah. that I can just come in and say, look, I don't want to work on this anymore. Yeah, something completely different. And I think that le- it's it's a, that level of flexibility I think mm. is is rare. And I think I'm very lucky to have that. It's it's like yeah. I mean, it's the kind of freedom that you associate with like being an artist or a musician in a way that I think a normal job you can't. You can't just change yeah. direction completely, yeah. and um, I mean, for me, these directions only change every four or five years. Yeah. But it's it's that knowing that you, I don't have to be doing this the whole time. Yeah. So it's, it's how do you excite that curiosity of endless, you know, questioning of? I think it's just there. I yeah. mean, for me, I don't. Do you think I, it's natural. Do you think? I'm not sure. I mean, I'm a bit dubious about it, like the the that N word because yeah. <laughs> it's never c- clear to me what that what that means yeah. and. Because natural sounds something like biological or mm. innate, and I yeah. don't think it's that. I think a lot of it's to do with context and culture and upbringing and and whatever. There's probably a little bit of personality which might be partly biological, but yeah. for me, it's never been something that I had to foster. It's just there, right? Yeah. Um, and when you do your work, like you know mm. these research papers and you know mm-hmm. these uh, academic papers, how you know what are the applicabilities that normal people can sort of use from this yeah it's very hard to sort of you know from mm-hmm. such an academic uh complex sure and no. sort of apply it to a sort of normal person's daily no that's a really good question and i think um the answer it's hard to give a very obvious answer because yeah. i think the kind of work you do it's hopefully going to filter in into public policy and things like that but it takes a long time it takes a lot of progress within academia for it to filter into something like that but i mean for example we started talk we talked a little bit earlier about racial biases and i was saying my work on emotions is kind of tried is trying to understand whether emotional biases can play a role in racial biases mm. and that's the way in which i mean can my work actually help people understand the kinds of shootings and America that's going on a little bit better does fear play a role so that would be a very kind of if if it does it's a very important role mm-hmm. and it's very you know maybe it's practical too so yeah. so maybe um maybe like when you send someone out on the beat and uh, you need to kind of assess how they're doing emotionally before they go and maybe there's ways to measure it like you can not directly but you can see like you can do kinds of tests and heartbeat tests and skin kind of conduct and test and things yeah. like that and see how emotionally aroused they are and if they're very heightened maybe don't se- send them out or maybe they, ha- they can have a monitoring system themselves where in the future they might be able to th- there's a machine in your head or something like a little ear piece that says yeah. you're getting really emotionally worked up right now like calm down and it's maybe just being it, maybe it's all that is just to be aware that you're being very fearful or very anxious in this context and then don't follow the instinct just calm down and kind of do something slower and even something like that that has a huge practical yeah repercussion so um it's not that one piece of paper i write is going to change that but hopefully it'll be part of a movement within academia on research on emotions and bias that will one day affect um public policy especially policy around law enforcement practice in a place like America yeah. which would be really great I think if it, if it happens yeah. but that the, but the, you have to also be honest with yourself and know that maybe some stuff you do just won't have a practical right but you need to keep digging and if you don't dig I mean think about something like um, quantum mechanics that arose and now you use that every everywhere like you know your fridge works because of that yeah. but but people when they were asking those earlier questions they had no idea that it would have that application yeah yeah so that i think idea. there's something important about maybe asking these abstract questions and working without necessarily thinking it's going to lead to something because all the really great stuff we have have come from those kinds of more abstract things right. i think but i that said i think the work i do I, has a very direct Right. And to me, like the why why I'm really ca- why I care about this is because I was living in the U.S. during a time when this was all in the news, and mm. of course you're affected by it, and you yeah. think like how how is it that exper- you know how is that you mm-hmm. know, especially you know U.S. is such a you know you hear it on the news like this happened that happened sure but it's real different when you're living there and experiencing how the common people feel those events you know how they how is that shaping them more i mean it, the, the bad thing is i think some people just walk around with blinders anyway so like if i bet if you are 
even now I think like the US is going through a tough time politically now um, but there's a sense in which maybe if I was an academic in the US what's going on might not personally affect me but if you're engaged then you're going to be troubled and affected yeah. by it and of course like with certain kinds of problems with um, young black men like being shot at it's going to affect one community right which is like the black yeah. community more than any other community so yeah. you could you could be like i mean my background south asian so you could be like me and not care about it if you wanted to yeah. you could walk around with blinders so i don't think everyone is affected by right. it but but if you're mindful and if you're engaged then of course it's kind of bad that something's happening to a yeah. group of people without good good reason yeah yeah, so I think it partly depends on which community you're from, but partly how just how engaged yeah. y you are with these things. I understand. Yeah. Is there anything in the future you, you're going to work on or you're thinking about working on that might be of interest? I mean, I still, I think I'm still very much into the emotion yeah. literature. I mean, not maybe I would want to branch out and not just think about how emotions affect reasoning, but more the kind of evolutionary side of emotion and like why why we have them and one of the things that's interesting is if if we if emotions evolved they probably evolved during a like a much earlier time so which what applicability do they have to the contemporary environment and what do you mean by that well i think like so so i mean and here's an example um, so some people think that fear responses for example are evolved so there's certain kinds of things which will trigger fear whether you're consciously the fight and flight response a little bit yeah but like um so they've done experiments where if you see objects that look like snakes when you're walking you will have a f you will be f you'll feel fearful even before you consciously register that you're seeing an mm. object so your body is already unconsciously reacting because you pre-wired to that yeah yeah so shape. the question is yeah so it's your brain is in a way pre-wired to react to that but then that's very limited and what so so emotions might some emotions might be adaptations in that way but what role does it play in contemporary life like like you feel so the question is like you you look at your phone and you see something on it like a tweet or like a stock market crash or something you feel fearful that seems to me to be re a response to something new that evolutionarily can't be programmed so you, you, you might be programmed to respond with things like sticks or, or snake-like <laughs> objects, but, yeah, yeah. but not stock market numbers. So how do, you, how do you grant that emotions are evolved, suppose? If you grant that, how do you think about them in the contemporary setting? And that, those, that connection to me is interesting. The idea that look at, looking at emotions from like a evolutionary developmental perspective and then applying it to the contemporary issues to do with emotion and bias and, yep. and things like that. So to me, in a way what I'm doing is probably annoying everyone because <laughs> like um, I'm drawing on literature in evolutionary developmental biology that people talk about emotion and I'm also drawing on stuff now in cognitive science and those two literatures will sometimes use the same terms but they, they mean something different. very different. Mm. So I'm kind of drawing on both and I'm probably using it in a different way again. Mm. And if I'm drawing on COGSI people in evolutionary development, developmental biology, people are like, that's not what we mean by it and, mm. and vice versa. So you're kind of annoying people, you know, every, right. everywhere I go in, in that way. But to me, what's interesting is taking these different disciplines that have, are studying the same thing and how do you draw on both? To like kind of combining the yeah to knowledge. to inform your the kinds of questions I care about yeah um, so so it's it's yeah it's 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 partly the topic that I find interesting which is emotion but partly just learning about dis different disciplines as well and seeing how they they use emotion and I mean I've been reading a lot of neuroscience on emotion and there's a lot of controversy even within neuroscience about the different theories about what emotions are and some people think emotions are these kind of evolutionary design things other people think emotions are kind of constructions like so you need certain kind of cultural context to even understand what an emotion is so that's what does that mean like different cultures experience different emotions differently or is that by getting that, that no totally yeah. so i think um 
some people think that there are these basic emotions which everyone has regardless of their cultural yeah. background so like things like happiness sadness joy surprise anger fear all this yeah yeah and it used to be i think 6 and now it's been expanded to 18 or something like 18, last time yeah. last time i checked but there's been a lot of recent evidence like it's test to suggest that 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 is just not supported and some people think um that you have these feelings so there's certain sensations that feel good or bad but you need the cultural context to under, to to create an emotion from that feeling yeah. so you don't so here's an example so um you're feeling a certain way right and it's it's you feel bad it, and you don't know quite what's happening and then you realize that you're looking down and you're looking at a piece of paper and it says fail and it has your name on it <laughs> and that's you're looking at an exam mm. paper so the context is one where you've been given a grade yeah. and so you think this feeling i have right now it's because um of my grade so that's a cultural there's a, a context under which you're feeling that way yeah. so if that's the case you might f- say i'm feeling anxious or sad but suppose you have the same feeling after working out and you f- you have that same physiological feeling and that the context is very different because you think i've just hit the gym and i feel that way so you're not going to say i'm sad or anxious you might say i just feel shattered i'm tired mm, mm, yeah so so if that's right they think that there's these feelings but it's the context which helps you identify it as a particular yeah. emotion right. um i remember once i was at a philosophy talk and i felt i was feeling i normally when i'm anxious i feel it in my back and some yeah. people feel it in various parts yeah. and i was just feeling like why am i so anxious today and it had nothing to do with what the talk was about yeah. and then i realized i'd worked out before and it was that pain in my back from yeah, yeah. working out and yeah. i was given that i forgot that i worked out i was looking for other cues to see oh that's fascinating and again and, and i think yeah. if i had just worked out and i felt that way i don't think my brain would have classified that as anxiety i would have my brain would have just said my back hurts i'm feeling a bit shattered right yeah. now it's maybe time to do something yeah. else but because i forgot that i was looking for cues around my environment and thinking like did i have a fight with a friend or did is something like that happening is that why i'm feeling anxious but yeah. i did remember thinking my brain was classifying that experience as being yeah anxiety or something like that so you have these base level feelings but to create an emotion you need the relevant yeah. con- well, context well have you ever asked is there feelings that only sp- some of us feel and not others or is the feeling mm-hmm. the sort of pool of feelings we can feel fixed or is I'm, it I'm fluid not, i'm not sure i mean at the feeling level i'm not sure i think at the emotional level it seems like yeah because it's fixed no it's not fixed because i it's i think right. a lot of people these days kind of grant that there's certain emotions which are unique to certain cultures um right. like maybe i mean i don't know if this is counts as a really an emotion but schadenfreude it's like a what is it it's feeling kind of happy or joy when something bad happens to someone you don't yeah. <laughs> um that's kind of a created kind of a culture dependent really yeah it's not, not like it's not universal not envy but i mean like joy in someone else's suffering i don't think it's universal and okay here's a better one so yeah. i'm probably butchering the pronunciation but there's an emotion that apparently is originated in japan called amai or amei Okay. and that's kind of this feeling of joy to do with like a shared experience or a shared sense of like a coalition or something yeah. and you could be skeptical and yeah. say well that's not really an emotion or that's just joy but i think it's categorized as like a different emotion yeah so so i mean i'm not i'm not to be honest i don't really know how i feel about the basic non basic emotion debate yeah. but there's a lot of evidence to suggest that there's some kinds of emotions that only exist within certain cultures in some that don't which is kind That's of interesting. Yeah, yeah yeah um so i don't know about the feeling part because maybe your bodies are only as humans trained or evolved to have certain kinds of feelings and maybe the feelings are s- the same but those feelings might be combined with thoughts in interesting yeah. ways to create different kinds of yeah emotions. have you ever considered how psychedelics can play a role in understanding emotion and the different yeah, states yeah no i haven't to be and i think it's a really interesting period now with yeah. psychedelics because i mean I mean as you probably know yeah. there was a lot of research back in the day and things went haywire and there was sh- completely yes. shut down yeah, yeah. and I think now they're using psychedelics to cure things like 
or to not heal per se, but to help with depression and post traumatic stress. Yeah, yeah, and it seems to be the results are quite positive yeah. now. Some big universities. But, but I think um, my only thing is there's a difference between treatment and understanding. So do we understand emotions better if you're on LSD? I don't. That I'm not sure about. But maybe it'll. Are we hypersensitive to emotions when we're on those substances. Yeah. Um, I I don't know to be honest. I haven't seen much research with with emotions yeah. per se. But I if if the general treatment research goes the way it does i think it'll open up interesting avenues and it might be like much more kind of kosher to mm. to be doing like i mean i think at the moment if i said i want to see how you know <laughs> lsd affects emotion <laughs> i don't know if i i don't know about my future career <laughs> here but maybe in 10 years time it might be just a very mundane yeah. thing to everyone everyone's doing LSD, like not doing but working <laughs> on the effects of well LSD. john hopkins and i think yeah john yeah. hopkins a major sure. university that is yeah openly mm -hmm. Researching this, yeah, and they're saying they're getting exceptional results, yeah, in terms of treating PTSD mm -hmm. patients. Also, I think maybe um, people are just doing it with more care because I think back in the day, like I think with Timothy Leary and stuff, and just handing out dollops of, you know, mm. pills. I I think there was maybe like a little bit of an innocence with because yeah. uh, I mean. There's really great, prob I'm guessing, you know, great side effects mm. of taking these things, but there's probably a lot of like problems with psychosis and schizophrenia yeah. and stuff. So you need to do it with a lot of some lot of cultures care. have shamans and yeah. you know people that it's like a sort of rite of passage, a mm -hmm. rite of you know manhood when you have to take it, and there's a person, responsible person who that guides, guides you. Yeah, that's which really is interesting. A, you I know, think. good way of sure. seeing. You know, drugs in a way, mm -hmm. uh, you know, responsibly mm -hmm. taking it. Yeah. I think so. I think my, my only worry, I mean, I think that's right. And I think maybe originally in the 60s as well, they were doing it in that way and then it got out of hand. Mm. But one worry is even if you do it in a guided way, if you're someone who's prone to schizophrenia or depression, even doing weed, I think like you run a risk of yeah. that happening. And yeah. um, I think whether someone's guiding you or not is not going to help if you're okay. biologically disposed to having and yeah. hope i mean I, I i'm not sure but i think the chances are quite low so maybe like smoking a joint is not gonna it's i don't think the risk <laughs> yeah. is that high that you're gonna get psychosis yeah, yeah. but yeah. if you're doing it a lot and if you're prone to it and if you don't know that you're biologically disposed to it then uh. there's a risk so i i would i would don't think the current research is going in that direction i think it's like studying with people with actual depression, how that helps. I don't think like there's professors like high on LSD kind of <laughs> <laughs> handing out dollops yeah, of yeah, this yeah. stuff. So I think it's been done in a much more res setting. responsible yeah. way. Um, but also, I mean, we just have a better understanding now bi of human biology than we did back then yeah. too. So there's better ways of maybe um, making sure that you're not giving mm. the wrong drugs well, to the wrong. Well, even measuring responses now, sure. the instruments we have is yeah. you know, great. Yeah, but I mean, I would love to see how the psychedelic research goes yeah. in, in like another so 20, 20 years. Or so. Have you talked to anyone who does that? I have talked to a couple of friends that have done it. Yeah, no, I meant who, done, who do oh, done research. <laughs> no, no, I, I meant the, re I mean, we all have stories yeah, of, you yeah. know, that, but I just meant. You mean like research yeah, and doing that? Yeah, and I, and I don't no, mean like research no. as in I took some no, drugs no. and went to a tool concert. I haven't, I haven't met. Thing. Well, it would be definitely interesting to sit sure. down with someone who is researching that. Yeah. Because, man, they would. Yeah. It's a different. Well, the the new world it opens up, mm -hmm. you know, your perspective. Yeah. As to what I've sort of heard is. Yeah. It's really interesting. And there hasn't been. Uh, I don't know. It's not very common talk. or. Mm -hmm. the but there's lesson. all these interesting things about. Um, being more empathetic and having this shared sense of unity and mm. maybe doing that kind of replicates the similar thing that deeply religious people feel yeah. as well. And I was just reading the other day about how if you, if you, it's not just believing in God or something like that, but maybe like a lot of religious practice is routine. So it's, you're repeating something and it's repetition and it makes you kind of brain shut off in a certain way to certain things and taking other things. Mm. And that creates after a long period of time, a certain kind of unique bond bond and also yeah. like a phys so your brain literally changes when you do that yeah. and, and i think a similar kind of thing might be happening when you take the, yeah you know a psychedelic so it seems like you're both getting at like a similar yeah. kind of thing in a different way but could you be opening a different you know like what you said but sure. could you be opening it 
in a more conscious manner and knowing that you're opening this sort of these emotional sure feelings in a way and to be able to experience that i don't know it's, mm-hmm. it's just a I don't know, it's very fascinating. Yeah. Who knows? Who knows? <laughs> who, who knows? Maybe, maybe, maybe yeah. I mean, it sounds like the people who own LSD uh, or, or whatever are having yeah. religious experience in the way that religious people are having a psych- psychedelic experience, yeah. <laughs> you know. That's a Just, that's just a sober, yeah, you know. That's a tra- yeah. great way of saying it. Yeah. Really appreciate your time. No, really. thanks. That it was, was really fun. Awesome, awesome oh, talk. Cheers. Yeah, appreciate that. Oh, thanks. That's well.